name is Ibrahim Ali. I'm 27 years old. Uh, I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and my mother <clears throat> and my father were Catholic. I was raised Catholic. Um, my father passed away when I was four, uh, 26 years old. So that was a pretty early death. Um, and when that happened, my mother kind of fell away from the Catholic Church. Um, she kind of had, I guess you could say, like a grudge with God after that. And so I got into studying other religions really early on. Uh, I was kind of a dorky kid. Uh, I liked to read and, you know, one thing led to another. Um, so I got into like Eastern religions, studying about, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, stuff like this. Um, I recently just found out today, actually, my mother was telling me that, uh, my grand, my grandmother said that if I would have stuck with the church, she thinks I would have became a priest. But, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we plan and God plans, so that didn't happen. Um, my mother got remarried and I moved down here to Florida at about the time I was 14. Uh, when I came here to Florida, we moved to Polk County, which is kind of like outside of Kissimmee. Uh, and I was living in a house with my mother, my stepfather, his sister, her son, his mother, and three other people. So this was a lot of people in one little house. Um, and so, you know, I was like, I was young, my, you know, mother had just got remarried, uh, so I, I was going through the whole rebellious thing and, you know, not getting along with my stepfather, not getting along with his family well, and, uh, trying to adjust to moving from up north to down south and, uh, you know, just so getting into a lot of trouble and things like this. Um, eventually we moved out and, uh, we got our own place. Um, you know, I was in high school and, uh, you know, kind of got involved with the wrong people, got into different things here and there. Um, so as I grew up a little bit, uh, I moved into three group homes consecutively. Uh, I got out of the last one around the time I turned 18, you know, right around there. Um. And just, con you know, continuous fighting with my stepfather and with my family. And, uh, I ended up living in hotels in Kissimmee, uh, you know, by myself. Um, and this was like, you know, being 18, living on your own in hotels. And so anyways, you know, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but, uh, eventually, you know, I, I really, I had a drinking problem. Um, I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous eventually. Um, and after a few attempts of, you know, trying to quit and then going back out and then, uh, I finally got on, you know, the wagon. I stayed sober for a while and, uh, I'm, I'm still sober from that time. Thank God. Um, and, uh, you know, before then I had got hit by, uh, hit by a car crossing the highway. So, I mean, I, I broke like two bones in my right leg. I had to put a rod in my leg. I practically had to learn how to walk again. Um, all these things, you know, it was really miraculous the way that it happened because, you know, the car hit me just head on. Um, and I'd like to say that that stopped me and got me on the right track, but it didn't, you know, right away. Uh, after that, you know, it was the same thing like drinking in my wheelchair and just, you know, being stupid. Um, but eventually, you know, I got sober and I stopped and, uh, so at some point, you know, I decided that, uh, I needed to start looking for religion again, looking for some kind of higher power. You know, they emphasize this a lot when you're in recovery, they tell you, you know, you need some kind of higher power. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, but you need some kind of spiritual connection, you know? Um, and I went everywhere, man. I mean, I... At one point, I tried to get back into Christianity, and uh, that didn't work, you know. Um, at one point, I got into Judaism for a little bit, you know, um, and that didn't last either. Um, you know, the thing about Judaism, of course, for once, uh, 
for one, you, it's not that you can't convert, but it's a very long process to convert, you know. Um, so there's that. And then also, um, you know, I mean, there's the issue of Zionism, you know, and like how much the Jewish religion has gotten. I don't want to say the religion, but Jews as, you know, a group have gotten tainted by the, the ideology of Zionism and, you know, it just leaves a, a bad taste in your mouth. Um, but anyway, so there was a friend of mine who I went to high school with who had moved to New York and this person had become Muslim, I found out. Um, and I remember speaking to this person, uh, about Islam and it kind of went on from there. I guess, you know, I mean, from what my mother is telling me, from what, like, my family was saying, it seems that early on as a child, I had some kind of, uh, religious, like, inclination in me, you know, um, and for some reason, I guess, you know, um, ultimately because of, you know, Allah's plan and things like this, um, the, the the direction that it was going in as far as, you know, where my family was pushing me uh, wasn't working. But there was something in there that, that wanted uh, to seek for God, you know. Um, and I guess, you know, like, I remember just, even though I was doing so much bad, you know, like, the drinking and, and the drugs and, uh, you know, the fighting and everything else that goes along with that, you know, um, I think at a certain point I, I got bored of it, you know, um, like I, I remember I really got upset one night just because I knew that the life I was living, like, it's like you get that feeling like there has to be more to life than this, you know, like this by itself, it's just not enough, you know, um, I didn't like me, I didn't like my life, I just... I, I was sick of it, you know, um, but, uh, by, you know, and the whole 12 step ideology revolves around the idea that like, you need a higher power because you're weak. You by yourself as an individual, uh, you know, it's like your own thinking got you into this mess. So there has to be something stronger than you to pull you out because, you know, by yourself, you're just destroying everything. You know, um, and I, I guess that was true, you know, uh, as much as like my own mind was, uh, upset with the way that things were going and the way that my life was and my own self destructiveness and, you know, on and on, uh, as much as I intended to do good or I wanted to change, I couldn't, you know, I kept just getting into the wrong situation and making the wrong choices and doing all kinds of bad. I remember, like, I found this out because I, w I was hanging out with somebody and they pulled this person up on Facebook, you know, and uh, I think I noticed, you know, that they were Muslim. Like, I think I saw them wearing hijab, you know. Uh, I was like, oh, you know, they're Muslim now? And, uh, you know, I started speaking to this person. Um, and so... One day, uh, you know, we started talking about Islam, you know, and I had like certain misconceptions, you know, certain like, uh, preconceived notions. And I was, you know, kind of like discussing these things with this person and they were answering all my objections. You know, they were telling me, you know, uh, explaining it the way, you know, that they understood it. So that same day, uh, you know, something clicked. I realized that, you know, this, something made me want to accept Islam from what this person was telling me. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember they told me, like, you know, you should say your Shahada now. Because if you don't, you know, what if, you know, I mean, kind of like, God forbid something should happen to you between now and, like, if you do it later. And then you never get the chance to say it. So uh, I said it over the phone. You know, I said the Shahada over the phone. And, uh, later that night also, I went to a masjid and I said my shahada with the brothers there at the masjid. I think honestly for, for myself anyways, and probably for other people that convert too, from what I've seen, um, there's kind of like this period 
where everything is wonderful. You know, you have this real beautiful view of like, you know, uh, other people and life, you know, and, but then after a while, it's like you start getting these tests and you start seeing that like, you know, the people that you thought were so great are human beings too and they're flawed and, you know, so you kind of have to like reassess these ideas. Um, so, you know, one thing that really got me and, uh, I don't just mean this as a polemic against Sunnis or anything like that. Um, but one issue I had like with certain people in this community was that there was, there, there was a lot of like emphasis on fic, you know, like to the point where like, uh, you know, there was one brother outside of Masjid one time just going off about like, you know, this guy did something in a salat that wasn't correct, you know, and it, it was, it's just very, uh, things like this make it seem very petty, you know, like very, uh, superficial, you know, um, and, uh, but it definitely took time to adjust as far as like incorporating, uh, you know, Islamic rules into my life. And I think at first, when I first accepted Islam, I was very, uh, kind of harsh you know, in, like, the way that I practiced and in the way that I related to, like, you know, stuck for the love, but the way that I related to my family, you know, um, because I, you know, I, I guess, like, I, it took time because it's such a contradiction to come from, like, this place of, like, absolute lawlessness to incorporating, like, all these rules, you know, and so, when you put that much structure in with somebody who's so used to like no structure, you, it's like you accept it, but at the same time, you're so intense about it because, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, but, uh, so I, I know at a certain time, uh, later, there was kind of a burnout phase, you know, because I was so harsh and so, uh, tough about like sticking to the rules and sticking to the rules. And then eventually it was like, I can't, you know, I can't do this anymore. It's too much. I know that at a certain point, um, I was kind of looking for something more, uh, while, while I was Sunni because, you know, I know that like traditional Sunni Islam, right? There was a spiritual science that was incorporated along with like fiqh and, and aqaid and things like this, you know, like, uh, tasawwuf, you know, like cleansing the heart. And I didn't see this, you know, um, at least not like in a pronounced way. It, w it just seemed very like, you know, you come to the masjid and you pray and you, you just observe like the five pillars of Islam and this is sufficient, you know, or you go and you do the tabligi jamaat thing. But, um, I, I know at a certain point, like I started reading about Sufism, you know, and I guess there, there was some lack that I felt there as far as actually like, uh, you know, spirituality as opposed to just the outward practice of the religion. Um, but I remember one night I was reading Quran in the masjid. This was really the definitive moment that really kind of changed everything. Um, this was a Sunni masjid and I was reading the Quran and I had tafsir in the Quran and I came to Ayatul Tathir, uh, verse 33, 33. And the commentary in the Quran, in the Sunni Masjid, said that this Ahlul Bayt is the five, you know, the, the people of the cloak. And that same night, uh, I called this person that I took my Shahada with, you know, and I was basically like, you know, why aren't we following these people? Because Allah himself is saying, you know, I've thoroughly purified these people, but I go to the Masjid and I hear about everyone else except for these people. You know, and this person, obviously, there was a little bit of debate back and forth on the phone about this. Um, and so let's see, you know, after that, uh, I started doing my own research as far as, you know, the difference between Sunni and Shia and what Shias believe. Um, I ran into Hussein Mackey online and I was speaking to him. 
Um, he cleared up a lot of misconceptions, you know, a lot of the, just the lies that you hear from people about Shias, you know, and he was, you know, kind of just destroying all these arguments. Um, and he gave me like, and then I was guided, right? I read that they had an online version. Um, and then I read that and I found that there was a Shia masjid. I knew there was a Shia masjid in Kissimmee. Um, and it's, it's really funny. The, I was watching a video on YouTube from the Muharram Jalus and I saw the brother in the YouTube video that worked at the mall by my apartment, right? And the funny thing about this is back when I was just a young punk acting stupid, uh, I remember I went into that mall drunk one time and this was like not too long, I probably a few years, but you know, after 9-11 and me just being drunk and stupid, uh, I was abusing this brother, calling him a terrorist and calling him all these things, you know. Um, and so now here it is years later, I'm going to him telling him, you know, tell me about, uh, Shia Islam, you know, and uh, it's funny how things work, you know, cause he could have told me, get out of here, you know, go away. Uh, cause he remembered me, he knew who I was, you know, but he sat down with me and he explained to me and he brought me to the masjid, you know, um, so I got to the masjid and, uh, I prayed there, you know, I met the sheikh there, um, one of the brothers gave me Peshawar Nights to read, you know, and I read Peshawar Nights and the arguments in there were so good, you know, um, I mean, using Sunni sources and just using logic, you know, uh, and after I read that, it was so hard to kind of just disregard the arguments, you know, um, at a certain point, I did try to go back to the Sunni masjid, you know, like to try to See, you know, somebody, like, for instance, somebody told me one time, uh, while I was there at the Sunni Masjid, they said, oh, you know, all these Shia hadith, they say, like, uh, you know, like, our, our Sunni hadith have all the, the sanat, like, all the, but these, these Sunni hadith, they'll just say, from a group of our people, you know, and they're like, who are these people? It doesn't, there's no, there's no actual chain of narrators, you know, but it, it, it didn't feel right. Something wasn't right there. Um, a lot of the other arguments that they gave me about Shia Islam were just not, uh, consistent. You know, like it was very like, cause you, you have a difference between somebody saying, okay, look, this is Sahih Bukhari and it says this and we say the same thing. And then somebody saying, oh, brother, these Shias say this and they say that. It's like night and day. You have a logical argument using you know, Sunni sources, and then you have somebody telling you, yeah, well, you know, they do this and they do, but, you know, a lot of people say a lot of things, so you can't compare the two. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely, after a while, uh, I, I stuck with the school of Ahlul Bayt, alhamdulillah. Um, I also learned about, like, the event of Mubahala, you know, um, and you find out that these people that were there that are talked about were Ahlul Bayt. Salam, you know, so it just seemed clear. It was very clear to me. Uh, everything matched up, you know, and there was also there was so much like opposition, so much antagonism from a lot of people. Uh, as far as like, you know, the thing about me, I guess, and maybe other people in the West, too, is like, the more that you tell them to stay away from something, they're just going to go towards it more, you know? So that, that didn't help. <laughs> the treatment of reverts in the community. I mean, this community here in Tampa, uh, alhamdulillah, it's pretty good, uh, for the most part, especially like the I-4 masjid. I mean, the, the sheikh there is a convert himself, you know? So, um, but I think, on a grander scale, on a larger scale, uh, and definitely like in other places. It's not that it's, what it is, is that essentially this is a human problem. You know, racism and prejudice and xenophobia, these are, these are human issues, right? And the purpose of religion is to perfect a human being, right? But healthy people don't go to the hospital, 
right? So you go to the masjid and you've got a bunch of sick people that are trying to get better, inshallah, right? But, you know, we all act out in different ways. And for some people, you know, this is like, you know, they, they don't trust converts or, you know, they, they'll say, you know, like, don't let your women around them because they're just going to try to marry them, you know, or, you know, they don't know anything about religion, you know, and uh, it's, it's, I think it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, I definitely think like the African-American brothers get it worse sometimes, unfortunately. Um, like, for instance, I'll give you one incident that happened to me, though. Uh, I was praying Jamaat one time. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I came to the Jamaat, but I had missed my Maghreb prayer. So I went to make my Maghreb real quick in between the time of that prayer ending and the Isha Salah. And uh, I didn't make Kunut in my prayer, right? Because I was rushing. I was trying to get it done. So I just did, like, you know, the rest of it. Um, And his brother in the, the stuff, you know, he just started yelling at me, you know, like... Brother, you didn't do Knut. And, you know, I'm telling him, like, Knut is not wajib. You know, it's not a, it doesn't invalidate your prayer if you don't include the, the Knut in your prayer. Um, you know, and it just, it, it was like this, like, he was insistent, you know, upon the fact that, like, you had to make Knut in your prayer. And it just kind of gives this implication of, like, you don't know anything about Islam. You know, who are you to tell me? You know, um, and of course, <laughs> he was wrong. You know, at the end of the day. But, um, so it's either stuff like that, like, it's like this, this kind of like assumption that, like, well, you must not know anything about Islam, right? Or it's this assumption that, like, well, it's like either you get made to feel like you don't know anything or you're kind of paraded around, you know? You're like a little trophy that they carry around, like, oh, mashallah, brother, you know, you're this and, so, and it's like, you just want to be treated like a normal person. You know, it's like, you don't want to be insulted, but you don't want to be patronized either. You know, so it's like one, it's just one extreme or the other. And, uh, so, you know, um, and maybe, you know, I mean, to a certain extent, it's true. Like, uh, you know, a lot of people, I don't think, look for, uh, religion or look for God if there's not something that's kind of lacking, right? So definitely I think a lot of reverts come from having some kind of issues in their life. But at the same time, you know, I don't I don't think there should be this assumption that like because you reverted that, you know, you you had like some unspeakable past before your reversion. You know, because it's it's different people are are motivated by different things, you know. Um for my case, you know, I, yeah, I did some pretty stuff, some pretty bad stuff, uh, before I became Muslim. But other people, it varies, you know. Uh, well, of course, uh, inshallah, you know, I, there's a lot every day that I need to be better at, you know. Um, I mean, I, I think we should all be striving to have a, a better connection with them, inshallah. Um, but there's a few events from like the lives of Ahlul Bayt Alayhim Salam that, that stick out to me, right? Like, um, for instance, uh, the time when Imam Ali Alayhi Salam was in battle and, uh, you know, he was about to kill the guy and the guy spat, he, he spat on him and Imam Ali Alayhi Salam walked away, you know? And when he was asked, you know, why, why, why did you walk away? And he said, you know, I came to kill you for the sake of Allah, but then you spat on me. And if I would have killed you, it would have been for the sake of my ego. So I left. You know, and this is, even though, you know, I mean, my, my temper is unfortunately one of my, uh, weak points, but this, this is something that inshallah is a very good example about, you know, not reacting out of emotion or because of your ego. Um, as far as Ashura goes, um, the events in Karbala, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, uh, I think for a lot of people that become Shia, this is something that's very hard to accept, you know, because you're made to think that everybody who said they were Muslim back then 
was pious and upright and you know you don't even think about the possibility that like they would kill the the prophet's own family i mean that's like uh, it's just it's such a, a a horrible thing that you don't even think to that extent like okay if these people were bad you don't even include that as a possibility you know maybe they did this this and this but you would never think they would kill the the grandson of of the prophet uh peace be upon him and his family because this is for one you know uh I think a lot of people don't even hear about Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. Or if you do, you know, I've heard, like, somebody said, you know, to us it was like he never grew up, you know. Uh, he was just a child. In all the hadith, it was like about him as a kid. You know, Imam Hussein as a child with the Prophet. And then you never hear about when Imam Hussein grows up and becomes an adult, what happens, right? And then you come to find out later... What happened was, uh, you know, he was killed by people who called themselves Muslim. Um, I think now that I've reflected on it, I've listened to lectures about it. Um, one thing I've taken away from it, and I think this is very uh, pertinent to the times that we're in today, is that, you know, you had Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stops everybody on the day of the day of Qadir, right? All these people on the day of Ghadir in the burning hot desert, he stops them and he tells people, you know, first of all, you're not going to stop that many people coming back from Hajj in the middle of the hot desert to tell them anything frivolous, right? I mean, even if you don't accept that everything that Prophet said was from Allah, it's just bad o'clock to do that. If I stop everybody in the middle of the desert, I better have something good to say, right? So he stops everybody in the middle of the desert says, do I not have more authority over the believers than they have over their own souls, right? And then, you know, we all know, it says, okay, you know, uh, whoever I am is master, this Ali is also his master, right? So, there's automatically like a diversion here, you know? Prophet is trying to set up the continuation of spiritual guidance after his death, right? He wants his, his spiritual teaching to continue. However, uh, you have other people, and, uh, you know, we won't go into details, but we have other people that they were more concerned about temporal power. They were more concerned about, uh, you know, worldly gain and politics. Not that politics in itself is something bad, but, you know, politics as in uh, the kind that tries to gain off of people. You know, um, and I think that in today's times, with a lot of the things that we see done uh, in the name of Islam, it's the same kind of thing. You know, um, there's no, there's a lack of spirituality. There's a lack of, you know, preferring the spiritual over the material. And uh, this is why, for instance, we see things like in Saudi Arabia where there's so much opulence, even surrounding the Kaaba, you know, surrounding the Haramein, you have skyscrapers and, you know, big expensive buildings and, you know, golden palaces and all this stuff. And you have people starving on the streets, you know. Why? Because there's so much greed for what can I get in this life? You know, what can I do to enjoy myself? And, uh... Meanwhile, you know, you are exhausting your uh, your chance in this world to try to grow spiritually and to, to benefit uh, in the hereafter, you know. And uh, I think that this is something that really can be gained, inshallah, from the events of Kabbalah if people were to reflect on them.